Well, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been going to American Physical Society meetings for more years than you've been going to uh, these meetings. Uh, it's my first meeting. It's been marvelous. It's beautifully organized. I can't thank the organizers enough. Um, and Regensburg is a breathtakingly beautiful city, and this campus, even with the construction, is absolutely gorgeous. Um, so I also like to see all the young people around here and all the conversation in the hallways. It's just a terrific layout. So thank you very much. So this is the title of my talk, The Dark Energy of Quantum Materials. And one of the reasons I'm talking about this is because, one, I like to do outreach. And sometimes condensed matter physics, terrible name, uh, I like to call it quantum materials or some, whatever you're working on, um, this actually helps in the outreach and makes it clear that some of the questions that we have in quantum materials are vast and unsolved and no less fundamental than gravitation or cosmology or astrophysics. Um, and the other thing is that besides this great public engagement talk, um, I've also been doing this stuff a very long time, and I do have a broad overview. I, so rather than giving a technical talk, we're almost halfway through the week, not quite. It's late in the afternoon. We've had wonderful entertainment, enjoying all these wonderful awards and prizes, and so we're just going to have fun. I just want to remind you that I'm doing some kind of analogy and comparison but I'm comparing things that are the size of the universe and 10 to the 49 watts. That's what colliding black holes do. And in quantum materials, we have collections of electrons that are on the order of nanometers, and the energies are down in the milli-electron volt, or 10 to the minus 21 watts. So in tradition of several areas in physics, we're comparing things that are different in 10 to the 36th in length and 10 to the 70th in power. So what I'll do is I'll start with a quick introduction of the National Magnet Lab, where I've been for a little over three years now. I want to mention a little bit about superconductivity. It'll be more general, but just how serendipitous the discovery of new superconductors are. And then the definition, my definition, of conventional versus unconventional superconductors. And then I'll discuss something about the unsolved quantum materials problems. And then my fun analogy, the dark energy of quantum materials. And I hope you have fun with that. But first, the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. This is um, the, there's several magnetic field laboratories in the world. This is the largest and the strongest. Here's our campus in Tallahassee, Florida. And uh, if I walk from my office to my laboratory, my Fitbit is very, very happy. So this is, uh, it's over here in northern Florida, near Georgia, and that's where we have the largest DC magnet in the world that goes to 45 Tesla. We also have there a lot of high field imaging and several user facilities. There's actually seven user facilities in the National Magnet Lab and two laboratories, applied superconductivity and magnet design. In Gainesville, there's two user facilities. I'm going to show you just an example or two from a couple of these user facilities. What we have is the high B over T. So that's a very high field in, a, in, um, in low temperature. So it goes to nanokelvin. The fields aren't as high, but you get a different state of um, matter at extreme conditions in Gainesville. And we also have the Advanced Magnetic Resonance Imaging Spectroscopy Center, or AMRIS, where I'll show you an example. With a, it's in the McKnight Brain Lab, where we do a lot of novel magnetic resonance imaging. Finally, in, in Los Alamos, we have the Pulse Field Facility, and that goes to 101 Tesla. So the Pulse Field Facility is oversubscribed probably three or 400 um, percent. High B over T is 400 percent, and about 200 percent in our DC facility. So we're very popular, but I'll, uh, I want to mention some of the uh, um, hits that we've had. These are the records. So we have the largest pulse field in the world and the largest DC. But just in last year, we were able to get the largest field of a pure resistive magnet. And this one at 32 Tesla is all superconducting. And it's just, there's no water rushing through it. So that's just going to come online soon as a user facility. It's already getting highly subscribed. We have a 36T series connected hybrid, which is a large enough bore and stable enough to do MRI imaging. So um, that is just coming online as a user facility. So the MagLab attracts research from all over the world. And this is our Delta Airlines map, which shows you that Los Alamos 
Gainesville and Tallahassee are actually Delta hubs. Never mind. Okay. So um, we have many, many users in the United States, but I want to stress that we have users from all over the world. And in 2017, we had, uh, and some of these are actually other magnet labs, and so 324 institutions, and we, it's a, it's a user facility, and we, that's what we primarily are, and we train many, many graduate students. We have many PIs, many postdocs, many papers, and one of the things we're very proud of is if you do the statistics of who actually does research at the magnet lab, we have a turnover of 25% every year. All you have to go is Google National Mag Lab or National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, and you can see what magnets we have. You write a very short, simple proposal, and um, if you get accepted, your magnet time is free. Uh, you just have to get there, and you can stay with me because I have a big house. So there's three major magic mag lab research themes. One of them is materials, primarily quantum materials, energy, and life. So I'll give some examples. This is a picture that's familiar to many people here, and I'm going to spend some time talking about the high temperature superconducting dome. So what we have here is, you're gonna see a lot of these figures. This axis, well this axis here is temperature, and this is some kind of thermodynamic variable. So in this case, the thermodynamic variable is changing the content and you're increasing the number of holes. Underneath this dome is superconducting. So what has been seen in several experiments is you go to higher and higher fields, you break the superconductivity, and you can get further and further down. So at, at zero field, this is the TC, 90 degrees, and at, at uh, some of these, you can push it down to 30 degrees, even at the optimally doped. And one of the things that was proved a little before and also at the magnet lab, that the mass diverging is an indication that you do have a quantum critical point here. But the question is, what causes that quantum critical point? What's the nature of this? And why do we get such a high TC material? Besides just trying to understand the fundamentals, we are going to go towards higher fields, and we are being funded to do that. If you want to go to a higher and higher magnetic field, you're going to have to use a coup rate. Okay, right now, nothing else will hold those fields. Not because the TC is higher, but because the, um, the field at which it can sustain superconductivity, the upper critical field, is that high in the cuprate superconductors. Now, another example that I like to show off, because most of the people here don't know about this one or the next one, is ion cyclotron resonance, which is basically a mass spectrometer on steroids. And what you do is you put in a high field. In this case, we're using the 14 Tesla magnet. You put, it's a very high homogeneity. You put a spit of something in there, and you put a big field on it, and you measure the mass by doing a laser chirp. So here's an example of the cone you get. So just in a few mass Daltons, we find more than 100,000 different molecules in oil. And this is used a lot for oil. If you compare to the, uh, the competing technique, which is time of flight uh, spectroscopy, what we find is that this is much, much higher resolution. So what can you do with this? I'm gonna give you two examples. One example is petroleumics, which is really how it was developed. You can tell exactly what's in the complicated oil molecule. So it can be used for forensics. If there's an oil spill, you can figure out exactly what oil head that came from even much, much later. And also, uh, and it, also, it turns out that Exxon and British Petro Petroleum, BP, will come to us because if they dig wells in the Gulf, it costs a billion dollars to dig an oil well in the Gulf. And they would like to know if they hit the same oil reserves or not. And we can definitively answer that question. Um, and another thing, there are several things we do with this. Another one is proteinomics. It turns out it's so sensitive, so sensitive to mass, that we can tell by doing a hydrogen deuterium uh, diffusion if things like the P53 molecule by the way it registers. The P53 uh, protein is a protein that can be healthy to uh, uh, malignant depending on how it's folding. So we're trying to develop this technique so we could understand the protein and if this is a dangerous or not dangerous p53 uh, protein. 
another example, and I have just two more examples, is why would you want to do MRI at very, very high field? 21 Tesla. When you go into an MRI machine, and probably most people here have done that, if you're over 25, what's the best part about going into an MRI? You get to go inside of a superconducting magnet, okay? So that's pretty cool. But this is actually not two to four Tesla that you get in commercial MRIs. This is 21 Tesla. So if you're looking at something dead, <laughs> like a, a, a cell imaged, in the, you could see one millimeter diameter if you're at low Tesla, but if you're going to 21 Tesla, you can actually go down to uh, microns air, uh, diameter of seeing things. So you significantly increase the resolution. Unfortunately, as most of you know, NMR, you put a field on it, and then there's a matching between the applied RF field and the magnet. And as you go up in field, if you want to image hydrogen or proteins, which is what we do when we go to the hospital, if we want to do it at 21 Tesla, the RF you apply is so high that it's dangerous. But let's try something different. Let's unlock the periodic table. So now let's image on something that isn't hydrogen. So we've done many, many different kinds of imaging, and this particular one right here is an example of imaging on sodium. So the, the, we have a rat that unfortunately has brain cancer. You can buy them. <laughs> uh, didn't know that. And um, what we're imaging is the sodium. So the sodium, the resonance condition is much lower, so you have lower resolution, but you, the sodium, you can see where it is. So here's a low resolution image of the sodium. And it turns out that when cells are dying, they uptake sodium. We don't really know the details why, but we don't have to. A lot of this research is statistical. So what you do then is you give the rat a regimen of uh, chemotherapy, and then you wait four days. And you can repeat this until the tumor lights up. If the tumor lights up, that means that it's uptaking sodium and the cells are dying, which give you some, gives you some confidence that regimen of chemotherapy might be helpful. And by the way, the rats come out of this completely healthy and running around, so they're not, they're not harmed in this. So that's enough of the magnet lab. What I'm going to do now is talk a little bit. Since we started early, can I go until... Anyhow, I can go on all night. Um, okay, break. We're going to talk a little bit about what superconductivity is uh, because it's kind of fun. And I think most of you know that, that a superconductor has a resistivity that decreases with decreasing temperature. And unlike a normal metal, below a certain temperature, the resistivity falls to zero, typically very, very quickly. And this, in conventional superconductors, is a solved problem. And I'll argue that several times here. But another thing that happens in superconductors is that, as, which was a big giveaway to giving the mechanism, is that they expel magnetic fields. Conventional superconductors abhor magnetic fields. They just spit those magnetic field lines out. So um, what, does di what does perfect diamagnetism mean? If I can get this started. There's always a challenge in this. So you've, most of you have seen this before. It's really fun to give, you know, to do it in person, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things about using a superconductor to levitate things is that the vortices in type two superconductors, I'll explain later, get pinned on. So look how stable this is. You saw it being pun bumped and everything like that. If you take two magnets and try to levitate them, it's an unstable situation. That's called Harshaw's theorem. So there's actually people looking at levitated trains, not just, in high not just in magnets, but also in high temperature superconductors. And here's an, here's an example of a, um, of a levitated train that's actually made out of high temperature superconductors. It's a prototype in Japan. Now, I've been on the Shanghai levitated train, but this is superconductor. And it turns out this is actually, <clears throat> sorry about my voice, this is actually an old technology there were levitated, there was a prototype levitated superconducting train using conventional superconductors in Japan in the late 1960s. It only went one kilometer, but my Japanese colleagues were very proud of the fact that it went 
far enough to take their funding agents for a ride. Now, it, when I mentioned that superconductors spit out the magnetic field, if it's a type 1 superconductor, it spits out all the field. But it doesn't take that much field to break the superconductivity. A type two, you have to pay attention so you can follow the next movie. So a type 2 superconductor is something a little different in that what it does is allows penetration of magnetic field lines into the superconductor. So you get these magnetic field lines penetrating the superconductor and the rest of the superconductor is shielded by this abhorring magnetic field, the Meissner effect, or meissner oceanfeld effect. The Meissner effect of spitting out the magnetic field was actually discovered by Meissner and his graduate student, Oceanfeld, and it's called the Meissner effect. So all you graduate students out there graduate, so you make sure you get credit. Okay, so, um, so what happens, what you really want to do is these, the inside of these vortices are not superconducting. So if they're allowed to move, okay, they will carry normal electrons with it that aren't Cooper paired, and they'll dissipate energy. So a part of our research for applications, and it's actually quite a challenge in high temperature superconductors, is pinning those vortices. And that's the key to applications. So now we have a little movie now, and for those of you that don't know any superconductivity will be able to follow it. Okay, so um, I mentioned that, so now you could understand that because you've had the background, uh, even though if you're not in superconductivity. So um, I mentioned before that there was a phase diagram of the high temperature superconductors and there was a dome. Here's a representation of that, okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's not actual data, it's to represent it. And this is a phase diagram that doesn't really exist for conventional superconductors. This exists for unconventional superconductors. So before I describe this phase diagram, I want to show you a plot which is the temperature below which something superconduct and the year of discovery. Okay? So we see that the red dots here are conventional superconductors. And that TC has been growing since the discovery in 1911. To be honest, what I need to do is plot the many, many families of superconductors that are missing on this plot. So all these other ones here, these are the heavy Fermion superconductors. These are the high temperature cuprates. These are the iron-based high temperature superconductors. These superconductors look like they're not conventional. A conventional superconductor, and I'm going to assume most of you have an idea what that is, Above its superconducting transition temperature, Tc, it's a weakly or uncorrelated metal. And we know how to calculate the optical, transport, and thermodynamic properties of those, mostly using density functional theory or other electronic structure computational techniques. It, um, if you go below Tc, we're Cooper paired, and the BCS theory is the fundamental microscopic mechanism and then Begoliabov Dijen came out with a series of equations. Instead of a Schrodinger equation, it's two Schrodinger like equations one for electrons, one for holes, and the cross term. And with those Begoliabov Dijen or BDG equations, you can really model all superconductors. That's what I do for a living. Even the high TC superconductors and the heavy Fermion superconductors, they all have this, even though we don't know the pairing mechanism, they still have these pairs. I don't know if you can call them Cooper pairs, but they are kind of like Cooper pairs. So let's talk about, this is the unconventional superconductor phase diagram. This is temperature up here, and this is a thermodynamic variable. It could be doping, it could be pressure, it could even be magnetic field. But what we have here is that on the left side of this equation, you have a bad metal that's typically antiferromagnetic or an insulator in the case of the cuprates. On the right side of this diagram, at the high doping, high pressure side, you have pretty much a normal metal, a Fermi liquid, that you can describe. When these phases meet down here somewhere, you get this emergence of the superconductivity that's hiding that quantum critical point. Very interesting. 
But this point here, why these, when you lower the temperature, the electrons can't decide to be antiferromagnetic or a simple metal, and they fall into the superconductivity phase. Very interesting. But under this dome is a superconductor, and we could model those properties, optical, thermodynamic, and uh, transport properties. Um, if it's got a different order parameter symmetry like D wave, you can put that in the equations. If it's multi-band, it's still a little more difficult, but you could model these things, and it works very, very well. On the right side of this phase diagram is your Fermi liquid, which, as I mentioned earlier, we do know how to explain and model. When you get up into these little stars here, you come across an array, depending on the material, of correlated electron states, which I'm calling quantum matter, okay, which most people call quantum matter. And what happens, you, the electrons will go into whatever is up there, goes into these wild states where the electrons can form clumps or stripes or get very heavy and a variety of things at pretty high temperatures, some approaching room temperature, some higher than room temperature. And I'll flash some examples. So why do we want better superconductors? Well, the obvious thing here is that TCs has gone up quite a bit. And as I mentioned, some of these materials here can take very, very high fields for research magnets. So first of all, the fundamental research, they're a playground for electron correlations, which we still have a long way to learn, and for an array of broken symmetries. There's really fascinating symmetries in these problems, not just the order parameter symmetry, but many other symmetries that you can break. But we don't know how to design these materials, and we don't know a lot of the mechanisms. And the applications are pretty exciting. I already mentioned high field magnets. Um, and right now, uh, and for uh, our MRI, and they're used in super colliders. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the high energy physics community does more support of superconducting materials and magnet design than any other community. And you know, the Magnet Lab works with, um, with CERN, and it's, it's really a fascinating idea. Um, it's also if you want to detect small magnetic fields, like uh, superconducting quantum interference devices, and these are materials that are still open that may be useful for quantum computing or just any kind of AI. Uh, so, and then for energy, which I won't spend time talking about this, but uh, there's reasons why you want to replace places on the power grid with superconductors. Um, it turns out that for turbines, they're being used already because turbines nowadays are so large. If you make the generator out of a superconducting material, it's much lighter and much easier to use. And also for magnetic energy storage. Here's an example from the uh, ITER machine in France. And here's an example of what we don't have in high TC, something that proves what's really going on here. So this is an old Macmillan and Rall thing um, figure where they were doing tunneling and they were able to prove the microscopic theory of conventional superconductivity. Dozens of these problems, only two are solved. So th there's so much serendipity in this. So these materials were discovered in 1911 Kamerlich Onis in Leiden was trying to see, it was called the race for the cold. And he learned to make a refrigerator with his technician, Giles Host, who went on then to start Philips, so pretty impressive people. Um, and they made, in 1909, they made a refrigerator, which works somewhat like your refrigerator at home, but using high pressure helium. And they were able to go down to about 4.2 degrees. Out of curiosity, they decided, let's take a really clean material and measure its resistivity as a function of temperature. And they chose mercury because it was liquid at room temperature and you could clean it. And the predictions were that the resistivity would go up or it flatten out or it go to zero. This was not predicted at all. And so that was the discovery that below about four degrees, the resistivity of aluminum fell abruptly to zero. And I want to add something, especially for the students here, is that it took many, many years to prove it was zero resistance. There was a lot of, uh, it's a very interesting history. It's easy to measure an effect, but it's hard to prove something is not just really small. 
And so if the history of how this was proven in the years that it took is also very interesting. And I also want to say in about 1912 uh, or 13, Kamala Onis was making statements about how superconductivity can really help the world energy crisis. So interesting history. Then for the next years, decades, nobody knew how to design a superconductor. People would just mix things together. In the 50s, Bert Matthias at Bell Laboratories made a living out of this. And in 1952, he actually discovered the first new class of superconductors. He took a semiconductor and a magnetic material and made, you know, ground them together and made a new superconductor with a magnetic and a semiconducting base. He had a rule there which was, some of his rules were very good, but stay away from oxygen, magnetism, insulating phases, and theorists. So what we do know is that the highest temperature superconductors are next to a magnetic quantum critical point. We need magnetism. And they also have oxygen in them, and their ground state is insulating. That's the cuprates. So Bert Matthias was right, 100% right for conventional superconductors. But for unconventional, everything's just really wide open right now. And uh, uh, one of the th one, there's a funny, um, a funny paper written by Warren Pickett, which is, what if the first superconductor by Kamerlik Onis that was discovered was actually a high TC? How, how would it have gone along there? <coughs> I think just as important to as the fundamental studies are the history of practical materials. Up until the time here, about the same time, there was a big, you know, um, John Hulme was at Westinghouse, and he discovered a material, it's a compound, that is, they're called A15s. Uh, the one that's used in the field nowadays is Niobium 310, and it's got a much higher TC and it's very, very strongly type two, so it could maintain its superconductivity in high fields. And that was supposed to be applications, but hold on there, this material is very difficult to use. It's very brittle. So what he then used was at Rutherford Appleton Labs, a random alloy of niobium titanium was discovered. So instead of having to use, you know, a, where the crystal structure was so important, and if you mess up the crystal structure, you destroy the superconductivity, this random alloy has a lower TC, a lower HC2, but it's the workhorse of the industry. That's what's used in the colliders and in MRIs. So unless you have to go to higher TC and HC2, this is the workhorse of the field. But I will say that uh, CERN is looking into using the A15s now, and there's other steps forward. And this was another important time of discovery. And to me, this is the beginning of high temperature superconductivity. And this is quite significant. Uh, not too far from here, um, Frank Steglish discovered superconductivity in heavy electron materials. So heavy electron materials are materials that are non-Fermi liquid-like through most of their phase diagram. And as you lower the temperature, the mass of the electron measured thermodynamically gets larger and larger. From, I'll show you some of my data, I promise only one slide. The M star is 85, for cerium copper six, it's 1,000. They're fascinating materials. That heaviness is due to electron-electron correlation. It's not due to what you calculate when you calculate the mass of a Fermi liquid. Then, this was the beginning of this dome phase diagram. Gil Landris took one of these heavy fermion materials and just put a lot of pressure on it. And that was the first time that the superconducting dome was seen. So what do we see now? Magnetism is good, anti-ferromagnetic Fermi liquid. For some reason, you want to be near a magnetic quantum critical point, and uh, all of a sudden, it's very clear that the electron phonon BCS theory is not holding. I like to throw this slide in just to give you hope or discourage you, I don't know which. But basically, almost all superconductors were discovered by serendipity. Seek and you shall find. Here's three examples, and there, there are several more, of people that went to predict, well, actually four examples, predicted that certain things, or they claim to have predicted that certain materials would superconduct. One a very long time ago, Marvin Cohn predicts superconductivity in strontium titanate. We heard about that today. It's a very interesting material. 
Matthias and Hammond predicted barium potassium bismuth oxide, and they even went in and measured it, and it was superconducting. And we all know about Bednorst and Mueller and the cuprates, and the cuprates being pushed up to 90 degrees. My message from this slide is this. I know these people. <laughs> They're really smart. I mean, scary smart. And they work very, very hard. And they each have basically one hit. So if we could predictively design superconductors, each of these people would have more than one hit. So this is a wide open field. It's very exciting. And this Paul Chu is still working day and night trying to find new superconductors. So the field is wide open. There's been a lot of Nobel Prizes in superfluidity and superconductivity. And if one of you young people finds a way to predictively design a superconductor, your name will go there. So, OK. So here's some examples. I'm going to get a little more, more general here, or maybe less general, I'm not sure. But here are some examples of these phase diagrams. OK, so this is the heavy fermion I showed you. There's dozens of heavy fermions, maybe hundreds by now. Um, and you know, up here, the electrons get very heavy. The cuprates have the same kind of phase diagram. We have a Fermi liquid here. We have a strange metal here. The iron-based superconductors, I've studied both of these a good deal. And here we have magnetic out here is Fermi liquid, superconductivity under the dome. This, they, we have superconductivity in, um, in organics. And these are the transition metal dichalcogenides, which also was found a few years ago to have that. Um, here's another iron-based superconductor. It's fascinating. I should have put my 115s up there. But I mean, I don't think for a second that these will all have the same mechanism. But it's interesting that they all show, they don't all show, this is quantum mechanics. Nothing is 100%, right? If I say all, you know I mean almost all. <laughs> so, so most of the unconventional, almost all of the unconventional superconductors have this ubiquitous phase diagram. I like to throw this in just for the, this is the quark gluon plasma. It doesn't quite match up one to one, but we do have a dome, okay? And we do have quantum matter, hadronic matter, and color superconductivity. The hadronic matter, hadronic matter is like the normal hadrons, like protons and stuff like that. A message for the dome, OK? So this is, again, the ubiquitous phase diagram. Approximately all high temperature superconductors have this phase diagram, OK? Um, and as I mentioned, one side is the insulator, one side is the Fermi liquid, and the superconductivity is the center. Approximately all unconventional superconductors have this strange behavior above the superconducting dome. Now, one thing that you're kind of figuring out here, and there's been a lot of measurements to support this, on the highly correlated side, where you have the bad metals, okay, we see that it's a dome, so TC goes down. So too much correlation kills the TC. Over here on the Fermi liquid side, we see a TC is also going down as we increase the hole doping or the pressure or the field or other thermodynamic parameters. And TC goes down. So if the correlations are too weak, superconductivity is not as strong. Somewhere in the middle, it's the highest TC. So even though the correlations will kill TC, you don't get high TC without it. There's some delicate balance of what's going on, this is, and I'm working on this all the time when I'm not doing policy and this other stuff, um, where you have some kind of strong correlation at high temperature, and at the right level, that breaks into the, the pairing underneath the superconducting dome. And that's what I study now. So, um, oh good, I won't be late. Um, there are many new techniques that have been developed to study quantum matter, okay? Um, I listed many of them here. And these have been increased that are astounding. I just finished working on uh, the National Science, um, the National Academy of Sciences Decadal Survey and Materials Research. And even if I just read the literature and go to conferences, I am astounded at how far this field has gone. So in many of these things, this is quantum oscillations. So you put one of these materials in a high field at the magnet lab, not, or other magnet labs, and you measure the uh, Shumdakov de Haas oscillations as a function of angle, and you can actually map out the Fermi surface. 
And you can see that in the cuprates, you have this interesting quasi two-dimensional Fermi surface. And these measurements were only possible because of developing the techniques and the high quality crystals and the way the computation techniques have gone forward so much. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of STM, ARPAs, um, RICs, terahertz. So all these things that people have been able to do that are brand new. My techniques are point contact and planar tunneling spectroscopy. And we've developed these techniques beyond what I ever would have thought of, partially because we know how to make the materials better and we know how to analyze the materials. So the measurements are astounding, but so has the quality of the crystal growth. It's really changed the field. And the steps forward in theory and particularly quantum, particularly quant computation are pretty amazing. So here's some little examples. I wanted to pick out this example here because it's my data. <laughs> well, actually, my graduate student's data. Um, so what we have here is another example of an iron-based superconductor. Here's the superconducting dome. And this region here is actually due to electronic pneumaticity. So if you know what a, what a um, liquid crystal is, the pneumatic phase is when you have these, these liquid crystals that kind of line up a little bit but they don't, they're not a real, they don't have translational symmetry like a standard crystal. So what happens in these iron-based superconductors, and we could measure this with our techniques, um, is that the, at high temperature up here, above this green band here, up here, if you look down on the lattice, it's tetragonal, it's square. But the electrons at 175 degrees, these are like 20, three degree superconductors. Way up at 175 degrees, the electrons start forming these sausages, or whatever, cigars, whatever your favorite is. And um, they actually break, they go into C2 symmetry, and they break the symmetry of the underlying lattice. And this is the key to all these correlated electrons, that the electron-electron correlations are stronger than the electron-lattice correlation. That's the definition. And there's many uh, other things, the pseudo gap, the heavy electrons, things striping up. So here's some example of just sort of um, quantum criticality. Uh, the electrons will line up, they'll get heavy. That's sort of a cartoon of electronic pneumaticity. I like that. One person I was working with made that cartoon. Um, so I have to show this. Here's one that's still unpublished. So using our planar tunneling technique, this is normally what you expect for a D-wave superconducting gap in this heavy fermion. That's expected. But as you crank up the field, and I, this, we actually have done it up to 18 Tesla, um, we lose the superconductivity. And above where this material is not superconducting anymore, and we're still analyzing this, we see a whole new gap come in. This is clearly not a Fermi liquid, and in fact, this is somewhat understood here. If you go in this other direction, in a dx squared minus y squared superconductor, you see the Andrea of bound state. But as you go above HC2, you see all this structure. So we have ideas. We're still analyzing the data. But here we have a whole new non-Fermi liquid. So unsolved quantum matter, what I call solved. Fermi liquid. And what I'm calling solved is BCS electron phonon coupled superconductivity. What's unsolved are these highly correlated electron. Um, in theory, if probably most of you know, this is a, a solid state condensed matter physics conference, is that if you, if you want to calculate electronic structure in traditional Fermi liquids, you need the crystal structure and what makes up the atoms in the crystal. And from that, you get the you know, the properties of the material pretty well by electronic structure techniques. An earmark of correlated electron matter of this kind of quantum matter is that that just doesn't work. Okay, there's some electron-electron correlation that dictates better than you can get from the traditional electronic structure. And experimentally, you just get these astounding states like stripes, etc. So the you you just measure those things. So this is I'm going to get this and then get to my analogy. So. This always makes enemies, but I'm going on anyhow. So here we have a traditional Fermi liquid. So we're assuming a pretty much a free electron one. It's a parabola, and you throw electrons in there, and you fill it up to the Fermi level. 
and here we have low temperature, we have Cooper pairs, and these are basically solved. Okay, fantastic. Now we go to unconventional superconductors. Um, TCs are higher, and they have this phase diagram. The far right side is solved, and again, we may not know the exact pairing mechanism, but at least we can model the data. When we go up here to this correlated electron, we don't really have, we have almost nothing solved in those. So I'd just like to stress that here, and we're working on it. Now, here's the analogy part, okay? You're physicists, I can tell this part of it, which is, analogies help us understand, and you can make up your analogies, but you really have to go to the science, right? And one of my favorite examples is the Bohr model of the atom. It really helps us understand and visualize quantum mechanics, and we teach it knowing it's wrong, right? So keep that in mind. You can never push an analogy too far. The inspiration was in 2016. I was at the Kavli ceremonies, and Kip Thorne was giving a talk before I won the Nobel Prize, and we've all seen this picture, and I was watching, and he's such a great communicator. I mean, this stuff is amazing. So this is even before, you know, this was pretty early on in LIGO, not early on, but before the Nobel Prize. And he has this picture up there, and we see the distortion in the space-time continuum of a very large mass, maybe the sun, and a mass that's smaller, maybe the Earth, and we see the mass, you know, the distortion is different. I took a picture of the slide, had several discussions with him, and he allows me to use this slide. And this won the Nobel Prize recently because of LIGO and the colliding black holes. So I watch this and I go, I've got an analogy here. I can feel it growing. This looks like a distortion in the, in the lattice due to the electron phonon coupling. So can, this, can I follow this analogy? And I told it to a few of my friends at the coffee break and they decided I was certifiably insane. But 56 hours later, <laughs> I thought about it some more, um, and I have an analogy, which is kind of good, but I want to remind you of something. CERN is a giant telescope to look for the Higgs boson, well-defined. LIGO is a giant telescope looking for gravity waves, okay? I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying that it's a better defined problem than quantum materials. So what happened with LIGO, and it's an amazing story, it was 20 years and $1 billion worth every penny. They built this amazing detector, and you've all seen pictures of it, and the energy was about 10 to the 49 watts. The energy that, that this, these two colliding black holes gave was more than the combined energy of the entire universe. But they weren't measuring light. They weren't measuring matter. They were doing something completely different. This new telescope, that they could measure a change of less than the width of a proton, okay, measures gravity waves. So for the first time in the history of, of humankind, we're looking at the universe with something besides mass or light. Now, what I like to stress here is that we have dozens and dozens of quantum materials problems. What I hope one of the take-home stories is, is that what we've gained in our tremendous crystal growth, many kinds of measurement, and many kinds of theory and computation will help us solve these many quantum materials problems. So a combination, some linear, nonlinear combination of these will be our LIGO. And what's the hope in the future? Okay, so Mr. Newton gave us the one over R squared M1, M2 law. That worked great. There were a few problems with it, like spontaneous action at a distance. And as Mr. Einstein knew, was that there are certain things that couldn't be explained. Other things, like the retrogression of the perihelion of Mercury. So what did Einstein come up with? That's the general theory of relativity. It's often been thought that if it wasn't for Einstein, we wouldn't have, this isn't the special theory. This is the gravitational theory with the distortion of the space-time continuum. I always like to say, why did he come up with that? Because he was Einstein, anyhow. So they built LIGO, and now for the first time, and this is the key, first time we can look at the universe using gravity waves, and there are substantial unsolved problems in cosmology. 
what in the world, what in the universe is dark energy and dark matter? Will LIGO, Virgo, these help us understand that? We don't know. And that's where we go to this analogy. Mr. Fermi and Mr. Landau showed us basically what a conventional metal was. Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer went and they found this other kind of material and they could explain something that wasn't explained by conventional Fermi liquid theory. And will all of our quantum detectors help us understand these quantum matter states? So my second last slide is two great unsolved problems in physics. Gravity. The progress was the Newtonian classical forces between objects derived from mass and positions. The Fermi liquid. The properties of simple metals, Fermi liquids, are derived from crystal atoms, what's in the crystal and their crystal structure. Um, the general theory of relativity, masses create distortions in the back down of the space-time continuum. BCS, um, electrons create distortions in the background, the crystal lattice. Will LIGO help us understand these basic questions? Will our quantum detectors help us understand these fundamental questions? So I'd like to finish that this is, I, I personally believe understanding these correlated phases are the key to understanding high temperature superconductivity and predictive design of high temperature superconductors and other correlated materials. And it's been an amazing, I've seen this field just accelerate in its, what it can do. And I think it's a really exciting time. And I thank you for your time. <laughs>